Good afternoon again. Uh, my name is David Cathell. Uh, I am with the Institute of Turkish Studies in Washington, D.C., also uh, here at Columbia, and in an incredibly schizoid fashion, I'm also at Georgetown. Uh, so many places, but nowhere at all, probably. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we're very lucky uh, to have um, a very knowledgeable panel that will be discussing the issue of religion, religious parties, and democracy uh, in Turkey. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Professors Ahmet Kuru and Professor Al Stepan for putting this program on. Uh, I apologize for missing the morning session, but uh, I had a previous um, uh, engagement that I couldn't get out of. Um, so uh, today's panel um, will consist of uh, Professor Stepan, who will go second. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Statis Kilias. Kalivas. Kali you see, I got it before and now I didn't get it. Uh, Kusura Bakma. <laughs> and um, our discussant today is Miriam Kunkler from, uh, from uh, Princeton University. Uh, so I think without further ado, I will, uh, I will turn the floor over. Okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, show a couple of slides. Uh, so the uh, Professor Altstepan asked me to discuss today the uh, extent to which the Christian democratic experience uh, in Europe travels outside Europe, and obviously uh, in terms of the experience of Turkey. This morning we heard some parallels between uh, Christian democratic and Muslim democratic parties. So these would be some of the issues I'd like to address in a more general comparative framework. And also I'd like to bring to your attention, and this is what I'm going to focus on, the experience of um, uh, Catholic parties in Europe in the 19th century. It's an experience that few people know about, and I'm going to say uh, exactly how. So the way I'm going to proceed, uh, as illustrated in the outline, uh, is first of all uh, give you some uh, examples, but then I'll, I'll focus on a few concepts, especially the concepts of religious mobilization and unsecular politics. I'm going to discuss this idea of retrospective extrapolation, how very often we think uh, about the past by projecting the present. Uh, and then I'll discuss, and that would be the bulk of the talk, what are the elements of religious mobilization that one encounters both in the European experience and the non-European experience? And finally, uh, given those uh, elements, what are the potential paths towards democratization and out of unsecular politics given the presence of parties that are motivated by religious issues? Uh, I have a picture here. This is Wilfried Martens. He used to be uh, secretary of the European Popular Party. Uh, a leader of the Belgian uh, Christian Democratic Party and a very prominent person in Christian Democratic politics uh, in general. And the reason I put him up is because uh, it turns out that uh, when in March 1998, which is about 10 years uh, from uh, 11 years from today, he um, addressed a meeting of the leaders of the European Popular Party, which is the European Federation of the Christian Democratic Parties, he argued against Turkey's application for membership to the European Union. And he said very specifically that, and I'm quoting him, in our view, Turkey cannot be a candidate for EU membership. We're in favor of extensive cooperation with Turkey, but the European project is a civilizational project. Turkey's candidature for full membership is unacceptable. And he made the case on the basis of the Islamic religion along with a variety of other factors, but emphasizing very much the Islamic character of Turkey. Now, let me fast forward uh, 10 years later. As you all know, in July 2008, the Turkish Constitutional Court announced its decision on the, on the case filed by the country's chief prosecutor, asking the court to ban the governing Justice and Development Party, the AKP, on the grounds that it endangered the secular regime in Turkey. And as you all know, the party's predecessors, Welfare and Virtue, had also been shut down by Constitutional Court decisions in 1998 and 2001 in similar lawsuits. If the court decided to ban the AKP, it would be toppling a government that had received nearly 47% of the national vote in the previous elections. And given the stakes, it was natural that this decision would provoke extreme anxiety and concern. Eventually, the court decided, uh, declared its decision not to ban the party, 
and this decision was interpreted by many observers as signifying a major change or at least another step in bringing uh, the AKP and major state institutions together, in other words, in incorporating the AKP into the Turkish uh, political system. Now, why do I bring those two examples uh, together? Because I think they illustrate uh, two processes that I, I think are part of the same underlying process. Uh, on the one hand, the July 2008 Turkish Supreme Court decision suggests that religious mobilization, which begins uh, in a sort of anti-system way, may eventually become part of the system, be incorporated into a political system. And on the other hand, the March 1980, 1998 statement of uh, Wilfried Mertens suggests that contemporary European Christian Democratic parties have been incorporated into their national democratic regimes so successfully that they have completely forgotten the religious and anti-liberal origins. In fact, I take the statement as being precisely an example of the success of their incorporation, to such an extent that it created this widespread amnesia. Now, what is the underlying process that those uh, political parties uh, may refer to? I characterize this process as, uh, and uh, we may move into the next, or, well, just leave it there, as a process characterized by unsecular politics. And uncircular politics is very fundamentally a political process in which an actor uh, resorts, a major political actor resorts to religious mobilization, that is to mobilization of the masses using explicitly uh, religious appeals or appeals to religious symbols. Now, the main question, and this is uh, an issue that religious mobilization appears both in the case, uh, just we'll leave it at that and then proceed later, is uh, an instance that emerges both uh, in the European uh, case and in uh, the Muslim, the Hindu, and other religious uh, situations. The main question that emerges is how can we possibly discuss the two together? Uh, are not the differences between the political and societal contexts in which these parties emerge so completely different? So I'm going to make the provocative case that despite the differences, there are a lot of similarities and that we can get, gain a lot of analytic leverage by focusing on, this, on these similarities. And the main uh, argument that I'm going to make is that the process of religious mobilization in Europe and the process of re religious mobilization outside Europe shares at least five fundamental elements uh, which we can observe across these contexts. And I'm, go I'm going in the course of the talk uh, to go through, through them and describe them. Let me say a few things first about the fallacy of retrospective extrapolation. Now, the fact that the Christian democratic statement that I just mentioned expresses uh, this amnesia about the past of this political movement, as I said, is an indicator of how successful these parties became incorporated into the political system. However, uh, the problem with uh, the way in which we understand and interpret those parties today is an indicator of the fact that we tend to project the present into their past. And we tend to project their present into their past in two ways. The first, when we look at those parties, we look at parties that are very secularized, even though they use the term Christian in their names. The references they make to religion tend to be very indirect and very vague. And they do not generally take very strong stances, even on issues that in a place like the United States mobilize religious voters, such, for example, as the case of abortion. So we tend to project then the reality of those parties today uh, into the reality of their past predecessors and assume that because these parties are so secular today, they were so secular to begin with. And this is a mistake because it turns out that when these political parties emerged in the 19th century, they tended to be very anti-secular and very anti-liberal at the same time. And I'm going to characterize them to use a name for those parties and call them confessional parties. These were parties that were very explicitly tied to the religious cleavage in a way that post-war, post-Second World War, Christian democratic parties may not be. A second problem with uh, uh, retrospective uh, extrapolation is the tendency to view political parties and social movements that make claims that are related or associated to religion as being just and nothing more than political arms of organized religions. And then we tend to conflate uh, ideological statements that are made either by religious leaders or political leaders of these religious parties with their policies. So in a sense, what we're doing is very often extracting 
uh, policy type uh, implications from ideological tests, texts. And I think that's very common, uh, not just uh, in the interpretation of religious parties, but in the interpretation uh, of Islamic political and social organization in general. I think it's very characteristic that after the September 11 attacks, a lot of people called for a rereading of the Quran as if we could find in the Quran uh, the sources uh, of those attacks. Uh, this is not exclusive uh, to uh, religion it's itself. There is also a very a, a more general perception that successful democratization requires the normative commitment of political actors to the ideas of liberalism and democracy prior to the consolidation of those democratic regimes. And I think that's a correct view, but very often the process is much more interactive and much messier. There is an interesting expression that some authors have used, uh, and this is democracy without Democrats when they describe how very often participation in the democratic system itself is what generates democratic values and democratic norms among the participants. And I think here the very interesting comparison between Europe and non-European experiences is the experience of the social democratic parties of the 19th century, which also started uh, in a way that was opposed to the dominant liberal uh, democratic system, but through their participation became members of it and adopted those norms uh, to such an extent that a generation afterwards they became among the staunchest defenders of those systems. So let me say uh, a few things about religious mobilizations. Which are the five elements which we can distinguish, but, uh, we can find uh, are common between um, the experience of the 19th century confessional parties in Europe and contemporary religious movements and parties outside Europe, both in the Muslim world and uh, say in, in India, for example, which has a very important religious party. The first one uh, is what we may describe as an initially, at least, anti-system critique of liberal institutions that relies and makes appeals very often to religious terminology and religious discourse. I think it's, uh, everyone would agree that religious mobilization is centrally informed by this type of critique, which tends to take very often a very uncompromising uh, uh, stance. And this is true of uh, religious movements and parties that are both radical and reformist, and uh, organizations that operate in authoritarian, non-authoritarian, or semi-authoritarian contexts. Even, even though religious parties that emerge in this authoritarian or semi-authoritarian context criticize existing authoritarian institutions very often as being arbitrary, they often do not advocate the introduction of a liberal democracy. And insofar as they compromise on democratic institutions, they very often may mean that they just want to use those institutions as a stepping stone for introducing a regime that is not going to be democratic. At least that's the way in which very often their opponents depict them. Now, while the association between Catholicism and democracy today as part of this retrospective extrapolation fallacy appears natural to many of us, this was not always the case. To begin with, there was a very large empirical literature up to the 1970s that found a very strong correlation between the predominance of Catholic religion and the absence of democracy. And of course, it was very much informed by the Latin American experience. So there was a lot of argumentation that there were cultural elements within Catholic religion that made Catholic countries very inimical to democracy. And of course, we know now that uh, this argument is very difficult to sustain. But if we look at the historical perspective, which I think is not very well known for people who do not study the European 19th century history, then we find uh, a very strong turn towards radical positions, both in the context of those confessional parties, but also the official Catholic Church per se. Uh, this uh, turn uh, was very much the linchpin of a very well-known encyclical, a papal encyclical called Syllabus Errorum, the Index of Errors, which was published by the Pope in 1864 and which denounced in an open and explicit way concepts such as the freedom of speech, the freedom of the, sp the press, the freedom of conscience and religion, the legal equality of cults, the sovereignty of the people, the doctrine of progress, the separation of state and church, liberalism, and the modern conception of civilization. So the church condemned as a grave error the belief that the regime which did not repress the violators of Catholic religion could be good. And there is a very well-known description of this kind of attitude by a German historian who described it as ultramontane fundamentalism. Why ultramontane? Because uh, along with uh, other religions, Catholicism had a very strong transnational dimension. People, ver Catholics in various countries often look beyond the mountains to Rome in order to get their inspiration 
and they were often accused of being disloyal citizens precisely because they had these transnational ideas. An illustration of this trend, I think, is very nicely provided by the Belgian case. Belgium is, is a country that has the characteristic of being, uh, at the same time, considered to be very boring, but has one of the most interesting Euro historical experiences in which you can find every type of conflict from linguistic and ethnic conflict to religious conflict being active. Uh, even the existence of the country itself is uh, a small kind of miracle. Uh, so there was a very strong Belgian Catholic movement which emerged in the uh, 1860s, and it had this very strongly uh, anti-liberal stance. Even though initially it was created by conservative politicians, eventually it was taken over, especially at the grassroots level, by radical Catholic activists. Uh, and to just give you a flair for, for the ideas of those people, I'm just going to quote from a pamphlet of one of these uh, activists, whose name was Camille Doentin. Everyone has forgotten him today. So he wrote in one of those pamphlets, what should subjects of the Belgian state do if the law is indifferent and places error and truth on the same level as it does in Belgium? And he replies, they must lament uh, having to live under a regime so opposed to the rule of God and do everything they can to change it. To this effect, and since the law allows them to, they will use freedom to do good, to redress the ideas, expose the true principles, and spread the understanding of how much God abhors the general freedoms of speech, press, conscience, religion, etc. So this is not just a message towards the return of a theocratic regime, it's also a message towards the use of democratic institutions in order to achieve uh, precisely this outcome. So, we can find a similar type of debate, of course, in the Islamic world and in the context of Hindu politics in India. Let's look at the second uh, element, and this is the reconstruction of existing religious identities rather than simply their mobilization. So what happens with religious movements, and that includes the Catholic confessional parties of the 19th century, is that uh, they constitute a social and political phenomenon that cannot be possibly reduced to the organized religions for which they emerge. While they do emerge in the context of a broad societal religious revival, characterized by the enforcement of stricter standards of piety and the wide diffusion of religious symbols, they do not just mobilize existing religious identities. What they do instead is that they reconstruct them by blending religious, social, economic, and political concerns, by synthesizing traditional and modern appeals, and by mixing utopian, millenarist messages with concrete political action. In short, what these parties do are, they are not just an ex expression of dormant religious identities, but redefine them in a very uh, activist way. And in that sense, we can call these parties revolutionary and radical, not just within the context of the political regimes in which they emerge, but also, and this is often overlooked, within the religious structure they claim to uphold and represent. Indeed, their practice, more often than not, diverges in significant ways from their initial original religious matrices. So the Catholic movements of the 19th century, uh, which emerged in Europe, aspired to revive Catholicism and Christianize modernity in response to the rise of liberalism, socialism, and the secularization of European states. Catholicism in the 19th century was perceived as a declining and spent force, very much like Islam up to the 1950s and 60s, uh, and retreating in front of modernization. And what was needed was to re-energize it, uh, re it by giving it a new content and new meaning and using it to inspire the population. So the European Catholic movement of the 19th century had a very strong revivalist uh, uh, character, which we very often have find in modern Islam as well. In fact, the term Christian democracy was explicitly crafted uh, in contradistinction to the term liberal democracy. Democracy would either be Christian or it wouldn't exist but it couldn't be liberal. So similar types of tendencies are found in modern Islamist movements across the Muslim world, and there's been a very uh, wide uh, set of studies showing how Islamism or political Islam diverges from traditional or religiously practiced Islam in that it is thoroughly modern in its leadership organization and the articulation of its message. Islamist movements develop a new and modern form of organization uh, based on the primary role of social and political action and deployed uh, in a very creative way selective elements of Islamic tradition blended with modern elements to justify their actions. And I could quote a lot of thinkers 
uh, and a lot of works that interpret political Islam in that fashion. The third element is a process of mass mobilization that relies on a wide use of selective incentives and a concomitant focus on economic and social issues. So religious mobilization, as the name, the concept indicates, uh, is always, almost always about mass mobilization. Religious parties share a grassroots character, the result of a pioneering use of techniques of mass mobilization. And in turn, they derive their strength from the creation of those extensive social mass organizations. So the redefinition of religious is important because it's precisely instrumental in generating this mobilization. However, uh, even though the religious message that is used is very important, it is also important to emphasize that these parties rely as much, if not more, on social and political messages as well, which very often tend to be overlooked by outside observers. In fact, religious messages very often act as a catalyst that mobilize a wide variety of economic and social concerns. It has been noted, for example, that this type of religious mobilization tends to emerge in times of crisis and where processes of social and political dislocation are, are quite obvious. Now, the social profile of religious mobilization varies a lot, but it also presents some interesting regularities. So, the state is what provides the main focus of criticism, uh, be it the uh, liberal bourgeoisie, for example, in 19th century Europe, or the state, rentier, corrupt bourgeoisies uh, of contemporary uh, Muslim states. Petit bourgeois, urban and rural sectors that feel threatened by economic modernization sometimes are mobilized against the states, or uh, political and, and social sectors that are uh, increasing uh, their economic power but do not see this economic power being represented politically may often be find in those movements uh, the type of expression they need in order to claim the political uh, goods that um, fit uh, into their new social and economic position. So without generalizing too much, I think it is possible to remark that the religious cleavage that we think characterizes the societies also expresses the efforts of dominated actors who in alliance with sectors of the middle class uh, contest the hegemony of the ruling elites in the cultural and political field. Religious parties solve uh, collective action problems uh, not through the propagation of abstract religious ideas, but through a, a very well thought out system of selective in incentives, which is centered mostly around the local provision of welfare, uh, welfare services. They provide social services such as hospitals, clinics, legal aid societies, sponsor economic projects such as banks, credit and investment houses, insurance companies, education, schools, child care centers, youth camps, and wide networks of religious publishing and broadcasting. In more than one way, what they do is they locally substitute the state. And contrary to what one might imagine, their leaders are often the very products of modernization, graduates of major universities in medicine, science, and engineering. The success they achieve in building mass organizations is reflected in the veritable uh, counter societies, which in Europe were called subcultures or milieus, uh, which emerge as a result of their organizing efforts. So the 19th century case uh, of European confessional parties and Catholic movements is, is saturated by this type of practice. Uh, these organizations use the most sophisticated political weapons of the day, such as mass organization and the partisan press, Hundreds of associations were created, ranging from charitable neighborhood groups and moral leagues to Catholic worker clubs and credit associations. They were built outside the existing liberal political institutions as a distinct Catholic counter-society, which would eventually grow to submerge the liberal state. This dimension of the Catholic movement was reflected in the prominent role played by laymen and the lower clergy, and the critique uh, of this movement vis-a-vis -vis the Catholic hierarchy, which was seen as being too moderate and unwilling to engage into open political action. It was also embodied in a revolutionary at the time form of organization, which was built outside the structure, the formal tr structure of the church, uh, and this was the mass organization of lay people, primarily laymen, but also women. Uh, one very interesting detail about the history of 19th century Europe is that the main opponents of uh, women's votes, uh, rights to vote were the liberals, who thought that by allowing women to vote, they were actually getting the priests to vote instead of them. The women, women were seen as being under the um, very strong uh, control of Catholic priests. 
So uh, on the economic front as well, we see a lot of this type of activities. And um, this, what is very interesting about these parties is that they created confederate uh, organizations in which people very often were not members directly in those parties, but they were members through their membership in Catholic social organizations, be they organizations of workers, of peasants, uh, and uh, of sectoral groups, of industrialists, etc. So these parties were from the very first moment um, cross-class parties, precisely because their main message of mobilization was religious appeal. And this is the next point that I'd like to make. Uh, these par parties, unlike parties they were competing against, uh, had this element of cross-class appeal. So the strength of social and economic factors that underlies religious mobilization should not lead to the mistake of claiming that religious is just, religion is just a cover for what is really a class cleavage. Uh, Socialist parties rejected liberal democracy and built mass parties that combined selective incentives and, and, and the utopian message, very much like Catholic political parties did, but they focused specifically on one class of people, workers. The, the distinct element of Catholic parties was that they attracted a variety of, of uh, people and social sectors into their parties, including workers. So the social heterogeneity of religious parties, their cross-class basis, and their ability to wave together disparate or even competing social groups uh, is one of the main characteristics of those parties and is a characteristic that led uh, to implications and consequences for what these parties are today. Namely, their catch-all appeal, the fact that they were appealing to a variety of groups, and their ability to mediate between different groups that created uh, essentially a very strong uh, ability to compromise. And this very strong ability to compromise when it was, in a sense, built in the DNA of the European Union, which was eventually built by Christian Democrats. So the fact that the European Union is based on a give and take of a continuous compromise, this very often is um, denigrated uh, by some observers as being uh, a characteristic that you know, reflects inefficiency, uh, incapacity, inability to act in a deci decisive way. But this is the only way through which a very complex organism such as the European Union can evolve. And this is a Christian democratic characteristic, the ability to compromise a variety uh, of different uh, groups uh, uh, and factions. Um, the typical um, critique of those parties uh, in the 1950s and 60s in Europe was that these parties were opportunistic, precisely because they didn't, have to ha they didn't seem to have a very strong ideology. So here we reach one of the first paradoxes, parties that were created with a very strong and clean message of social reorganization ended up becoming parties uh, that were uh, essentially in the business of accommodating different sectors of society, of moderating society, of getting everyone to work together. And that was precisely because the religious appeal allowed them to have different economic and class groups incorporated into their parties. And the final point that I'd like to make is that those parties always retained links with organized religion. They never completely cut themselves from uh, organized religion, but at the same time, they were able to distance themselves from the church to become independent organizations uh, and were able to appeal to voters uh, in a way that was completely unrelated and independent of uh, the religious origins that eventually led to their creation. Okay, so now the question, having illustrated those five elements, would be how, given uh, the presence of organizations that have those characteristics, how do we move from a situation in which uh, these organizations are perceived as a threat to an emerging democratic order to a situation in which they are perceived and are a cons fundamental constituent, constituent part of that. And to do that, what I'm going to use, um, uh, maybe we should uh, switch that. Can you move on? Yes, uh, can we go back to the, uh, to the previous slide? I'm sorry, but when I don't have the... So I would like to focus on these three dimensions that allow um, one to create a framework that is inspired not by the similarity of those political experiences, but the fact that they share some uh, interesting uh, recurring elements uh, into an analysis that allows us to sequence, to, to trace the sequence uh, of political choices that may eventually lead to the reinforcement uh, of democratic regimes. And I, I'd like to stress three dimensions. The first one uh, has to do with the structure of political opportunities that the political regime affords to an opposition that includes a religious actor, a religious party. The second has to do with the structure of electoral constraints, basically how strong and how popular 
is the religious party. And the third has to do with the type of the religious party's association with existing religious institutions. And to that, one may add uh, additional factors as, uh, such as, for example, the effect of the international system. So if we go to the next slide, what I have here, maybe it's the previous one? Yes. We can start by looking at uh, and asking ourselves, what are the structure of opportunities provided by the incumbent regime, uh, especially in a context of an emerging democracy? A context of an emerging democracy is a situation in which democracy may exist but has not been completely institutionalized or may not be the only game in town to use Adam Shevorsky's definition. So there is always an alternative that is present in the mind of uh, political actors and elites, and so democracy is not perceived as being consolidated. In this kind of situation, we have two possible scenarios. In the first scenario, uh, we have uh, incentives that, is, uh, that are both positive and negative. That is, incumbents can threaten to punish a religious party if the religious parties behave in a way that is too radical. But if the party moderates, uh, it, can be, it can perceive uh, to have uh, incentives to participate uh, in the political, to rule, to participate in the government, to participate in coalitions, etc. And then we have a second scenario in which no matter what the religious parties does, it's going to be excluded uh, by power. In fact, these are scenarios in which uh, the incumbent political elites use the religious uh, aspect of the political opposition as a pretext for excluding that political opposition, not because they don't share their ideas, but because they don't want to share power with anyone. So in the, f in the second scenario, obviously, we don't have a lot of room for action for a political opposition that's religious. And very often in these kinds of situations, religious actors are going to be pushed towards radical positions. If you don't perceive that you have a possibility to uh, access political power, you may decide to fight by other means. And this is what happens in a lot of Middle Eastern countries, a lot of Arab countries, not necessarily in a lot of Muslim countries. So in those Arab countries, you have authoritarian regimes, you have elites, which sometimes allow some representation and some participation by the opposition. But in many of those cases, the, the message that they send is very clear, that those parties have no real hope. So what you see in those situations is the split of the religious parties into two factions, one faction which becomes a sort of uh, appendix to the ruling elites that, uh, in a sense, pretends to compete when, in fact, it is not. It's co-opted into the system in a very superficial way, and then you have a much more radical faction that operates outside. So radical Islam is very often a function of the authoritarian aspect of the political system in place. Now, the more interesting situation is the opposite one, in which the political system, the existing regime, may punish radical um, uh, moves by the political the religious party, but may also allow that party to govern uh, if uh, this opportunity arises. And I would say that Turkey fits into that uh, category. Here we have two possible outcomes. Uh, and this is where the second dimension comes in. Either the electoral constraints are big or they are strong. What do I mean by that? You may have a situation in which religious parties um, are mildly successful, but they do not have the capacity to get enough votes in order to govern alone. They don't have the capacity to generate uh, a parliamentary majority, which is actually very unusual, very rare in political systems. Usually, very few parties manage uh, to get um, uh, more than 50% of the votes, or even the number of votes given an electoral system that allows them to govern alone. Now, when they have to become to uh, ally with other political parties, then that is the main mechanism of moderation. The process of coalition formation and alliance with non-religious parties is what very often moderates both their policy agenda and eventually the, the, the agenda of those parties themselves and their identity. This is the experience of 19th century confessional party politics. The reason why these parties, most of these parties in Europe became very moderate, even though they started as very radical, was because they couldn't obtain large majorities, they had to ally with other parties, and as a result, moderated uh, their message and appeals. They became median voter seekers uh, eventually. And the same is true about the experience of a lot of the social and social, socialist and social democratic parties in Europe. Uh, it's also the experience of the BJP in India, which never won a majority, but always had to ally with other political actors, and that forced that party to tone down and moderate its religious message. What about the second situation? And this is the most tricky case. The second situation where a religious party appears, appears to win a majority, has the capacity to rule independently. Uh, and this is a problem because then uh, this uh, prospect or this reality can be used by 
the incumbent political regimes, but also by secular sectors of society to claim that by allowing that, uh, we would be suppressing the rights of uh, minorities, that the road of democracy would be closed, and that therefore that justifies an intervention uh, by the military, which is often the guarantor of these uh, regimes. Can we go to the next slide? So when, uh, as I said, there are no, uh, the electoral constraints uh, uh, are not what is forcing those parties into moderation, a, a, pot a potential mechanism, a potential solution is what I call a credible signaling strategy. And I illustrate that with the case of Algeria. Uh, this and, and Belgium in the 19th century, which are the only two instances, with the exception of Turkey, in which a religious party had enough votes to govern alone. In this kind of context, what you had was a situation in which strong messages were sent by the regime to the parties so that they could moderate their message. Uh, and in the case of the uh, Belgian Catholics, the institution that um, uh, took the role of facilitating the leadership of the party to moderate its claim was the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church was a powerful centralized institution. As soon as it realized that the only way for the Catholic agenda to be represented in power was for the Catholic Party to win, it decided to crack down on all these uh, radical Catholics who had these messages that were very worried, worrisome to uh, the secular elites. The same was the case to some extent in Algeria. There was a very strong concern among secular elites in Algeria that the victory of the Front Islamique du Salut, the FIS, in 1991-92, uh, would lead to uh, a religious dictatorship. And so in response to that, the moderate, the primarily moderate leadership of the party undertook a campaign to moderate its message. But it was uh, incapable of doing so. Why? For two reasons. The first reason was that it was a young party and it was not centralized enough to have the capacity to crack down. But this, is, this was also true of the Catholic Party in Belgium. The second reason it failed, however, is because unlike Belgium, it didn't have a very strong centralized institution such as the Catholic Church to help the party crack down on the radicals and make sure that the moderate message was going to get out. As a result, because of the decentralized structure of Islam, the fact that every mosque could be an independent center, the message that was getting out was, was, was very uh, heterogeneous and that was either used as an excuse by the military or was uh, genuinely worried, uh, worried uh, and pushed a number of secular sectors towards uh, the military and an alliance with them. So when you have a centralized institution, sometimes you can uh, solve this problem. Uh, when you don't, you may not. I think the, uh, this is where the Turkish experience comes in, and I think even though it suggests an additional kind of path, which is very interesting, and this is the path of uh, international institutions and potentially the European Union. So by tying, uh, in a sense, the process of repression uh, to a set of either uh, material or, more importantly, moral sanctions, uh, this is a factor that uh, constrains the ability of the more uh, hardline sectors in the military or the more secular sectors uh, among the political elites in cracking down on the political party, and it makes it possible uh, for a party that is willing to moderate in a context in which they may not have the ability to do, alone, to do that alone, to do it more successfully than otherwise. The other factor that I think makes sense and help us understand the process um, at work from the Turkish example uh, is the continuity in uh, the presence of uh, political parties and political activists. The fact that a lot of the activists that are active today uh, in the AK party, these were also people who were active in the previous manifestations of those movements, uh, generated a set of experiences and a set of expectations that proved to be very useful when the moment came uh, to uh, send credible signals. And what I think we have observed in the Turkish case, of which I'm not an expert, is a sense that this party has been very disciplined and very consistent in the kinds of messages that it was able to send out. So having a continuity allows for processes of learning, which in the case, for example, of Algeria, where the uh, span of the time span that uh, the FIS had in order to generate these kinds of uh, features was very limited, uh, eventually acted um, against the chances of the potential democracy consolidating and ended up, ended up leading to a very, very uh, severe civil war. I'll close by just making a point uh, and connecting this conclusion to the argument about retrospective um, extrapolation. Uh, in the case of Algeria, the fact that um, the electoral process was blocked, as you all know, uh, ended up uh, producing a civil war that was very violent, continues to a low level up to now, and caused about 200,000 fatalities. 
uh, very violent, very uh, ugly civil war. Very often the fact that the civil war took place and it was fought on the rebel side by Islamist militias and Islamist rebel organizations was used uh, by international observers as an example for why it was good to crack down on the FIS. The argument being that those people had radical agendas, the proof that they had radical agendas was that they fought the civil war in a very violent way and therefore it was a good thing and a, an acceptable price to pay to crack down on the Islamist political organization. But I think what the Algerian example suggests, if we move away from this retrospective reading, is potentially a completely different mechanism, which is that the reason why uh, a part of uh, the Islamist party, not all of it, became radicalized was precisely because they perceived that democracy was a one-way one, one avenue. That no matter how well they played the uh, game of democracy, they had no chances of governing. And I think this is a very interesting message uh, with respect to uh, how Hamas in Palestine is treated and to what extent uh, there is a perception that democracy works for them when they play the game or does not work for them uh, if they're not allowed to um, achieve the results of their action. So to conclude, I would say that um, the point of comparing the European experience of the 19th century to the contemporary experience of religious mobilization is not just to say that these things are the same. It is obviously, uh, it would be, uh, I think, not very intelligent to say such a thing. The contexts are very different. Uh, the global context is very different, the actors are very different. But what I think is, is interesting is, first of all, it qualifies the European experience from this kind of very easy, seamless process of democratization that sometimes we have in mind and sometimes the Europeans themselves try to impose on others. And the second thing is it gives us a sense uh, of how elements that appear in a very different situation can analytically provide some tools for us to analyze situations that are ongoing. It increases, in a sense, the number of observations we can look at, uh, it gives us a sense of potential counterfactuals. We cannot observe because they haven't happened, but, haven't ha but have happened in a very different, but at the same time, a very uh, parallel context. And I think analytically, uh, and as well as politically, uh, is a, it's a useful comparison, and I think uh, it should be used much more, um, in a much more active way to help us understand not only what is going on to Turkey, but how the processes of democratization operate in situations in which there is uh, religious mobilization. So thank you very much. <laughs>